keep going. So welcome everyone. Tonight we're here for the presentation, Landscape as Canvas, Earth Art. And we're fortunate to have Jane O'Neill, an art educator and art curator uh, with us this evening. Um, what she shared with me earlier was that um, in the 60s and the 70s, there were artists like Robert Smithson, Nancy Holt and Anna Mendieta. And they began a revolutionary practice of making art using materials from the natural world. So in this presentation, we're gonna learn about the inspiration for this art movement from art educator, Jane O'Neill. And she'll also offer some insight into the works of several leading artists, those that I mentioned earlier, as well as Andy Goldsworthy. So a little bit more about Jane. Jane curates and delivers art presentations throughout New England. Um, she holds a master's degree in art history from Boston University and a master's degree in education from Harvard University. She's a New Hampshire native and she's worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director, and the Courier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Jane has also taught at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at Southern New Hampshire University. And for more information about Jane and her programs, you can go to IamCulturallyCurious.com. And having said all that exciting information, I think let's get right down to our program and welcome Jane. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much, Holly. And thank you everybody for taking time out of your day on a particularly gorgeous day to learn a little bit more about earth art. I think of this program as a really nice primer for getting ready for spring and our gardens and our you know, our, our natural world. So, um, so Holly provided that, that good intro to what we're going to be thinking about and looking at tonight. Essentially, the earth art movement was um, rooted in the 1960s and 70s. And it's primarily American, some British artists, and they're sort of exploring, investigating the natural world using new artistic practices, and separating themselves out from the museum systems, the gallery systems for the most part, and the commercial art world. So these are really novel practices. There's a lot more to it. We're going to dig into it along the way. I feel like I'm making all these earth art puns already tonight. So forgive me for that. So let's uh, let's dive right in and see uh, how we'll be spending the next hour together. So we're going to get started with the real backstory for this particular art movement. And I'm just calling that section, the seeds and roots. We're actually going to be looking at a few prehistoric and very early examples of earth art and, um, and things that I think a lot of the artists that we'll be looking at sort of had in their minds as they were uh, designing and creating works. Then we'll move forward to the 60s and 70s and look at the cultural climate that existed at the time that sort of set the stage for this particular movement. And then we'll turn our attention to four different earth artists, Smithson, Holt, Mendieta, and Goldsworthy. Now, this is not a comprehensive overview, but I feel like these four artists give us a really good um, sense of the movement and a really nice variety as well. So, <clears throat> will leave hopefully having a much better understanding of, of this movement and I think a, a real appreciation for these artists. So we're going to sort of meander through this material in the same way as we see this uh, eucalyptus uh, tree trunks here from this uh, grove in a park in San Francisco. This was designed by Andy Goldsworthy and I just love this idea of meandering along this path. So let's get started with seeds and roots for right now. Like I said, this is kind of the prehistoric prologue to, um, to the earth art movement. So we're going to get started with, um, with really what is one of the most famous works of earth art ever. And that is of course the, uh, the famous uh, 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 sculpture installation called Stonehenge, which dates back to about 3000 BC. This is in Wiltshire, England. And there's a lot here that reminds me right. of the earth art movement. There's a lot that these artists are responding to. So first of all, these are major, major stones that we're looking at. These are roughly three times the height of, of an average person here. And originally there would have been these horizontal lintels going all 
all the way around this, um, this circular installation. So we have this notion here that this, um, that this earth art product has been left out in the open, exposed to the elements, exposed to human intervention, and it is slowly kind of in decline. It's been disturbed. It's not as it was originally intended. And that notion is really important for some of the artists we'll be looking at tonight. The other idea here is that this is a major undertaking. This required coordinated labor. This was all done before the existence of the wheel. And so there's something sort of mysterious and metaphysical even about this particular, um, about this particular work. What did it really mean? Was it, was it a celestial calendar? We know that there are some nice alignments with, um, with the equinox and, um, and the solstice, but did it have a sort of a, a, a sacred function beyond that, a ceremonial function beyond that. It just seems like too monumental a work to have an insignificant meaning. So I think that lingering mystery around um, the true purpose of Stonehenge is something that uh, that can also be sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, laid across as, as like a, a, a another layer of meaning and understanding for some of the earthworks that we'll be looking at tonight. Now we're going to move forward just a little bit in history to look at the great pyramids of Giza in, um, in, in Egypt. And these are of course, some of the largest pyramids in the world and most often, we kind of loop these or uh, group these under the umbrella of architecture. But in, in its purest form, what we are thinking about here are major rocks that have been cut precisely, moved over um, uh, great distances and uh, placed into specific spots and balanced there so wonderfully that they've been in, in essentially in place for uh, since about 2500 BC. So, uh, so the, this very solid composition, the pyramidal structure here lends itself to the fact that it has not sort of declined in the same way as, as Stonehenge, though we know there were um, kind of superficial layers here that were more decorative that have been stripped away. Now with the pyramids of Giza, you also have this notion of a relationship to the heavens, a relationship to the stars. There's some theories out there that say that this particular arrangement and also the size corresponds to the brightness of the stars in, um, in the constellation Orion relating to his belt. Some, um, some theorists have debunked that, but uh, again, there's also this this uh, this kind of otherworldly like metaphysical wonder about these works, their significance, the 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 monumentality of them, and this idea that there has to be kind of a greater purpose to them. Just a quick look at at, at how incredible the the pyramids are in terms of the scale and size, particularly the size of these stones. We've got a figure down here at the bottom, and we're looking up. Um, the edge of just one side of those pyramids and the preciseness of the cuts and the way that they've been placed is really mind boggling. So we're going to move from Egypt um, all the way to South America. We're gonna look at the Nazca lines in Peru. Now these were created in a desert and even though it looks like a, a, a clean line here, what it actually is, is a little trench that has been uncovered. The trench is usually about six inches deep. So it's fairly shallow, but like the, the dirt and the pebbles have just been moved aside and the trench goes um, anywhere from being about a foot wide to like six feet wide. Now the Nazca lines go on for thousands and thousands of feet. And in addition to just the straight lines, these compositions uh, across the desert floor, you also have these figures called effigies. And there are dozens of them, I think upwards of 80 different effigies. We've got this fantastic monkey here with the skinny arms and legs and the spiral tail. We have um, insects, what an incredible uh, uh, spider over here. We have flowers and birds. Here's the hummingbird. 
I love the design of the wings here as well. Now, uh, we also have a human figure, very uh, sort of mysterious, very otherworldly, why they would have this human figure seemingly waving upwards into the skies. Lots of ideas about that one. But let's go back to the hummingbird for just a moment and, um, and reconnect with this idea that this is art on a grand scale. Its purpose is still somewhat mysterious. In this case, it's been pretty well preserved because um, this is a remote location. There hasn't been a lot of human um, intervention here, and there's barely any wind in this desert, so nothing to really push these pebbles in the sand around. These lines have been wonderfully preserved. They were created somewhere between 500 BC and 500 AD, so over the course of about a thousand years, and we can still see them so clearly today. All right, so now we are moving up to North America, and we're going to consider for a moment this tradition of mound building in North America. I mean, you can, I think you can find similar mounds uh, ac across the globe, but uh, in particular, this mound over here is one of the largest in, in North America. This is in Illinois, and you can see it's about 100 feet tall. We've got a figure here down at the bottom, a few at the top. And so this was something that was done um, over a thousand years ago. So of course they didn't have excavators or dump trucks to do this. This is people digging up soil, transporting soil by hand, and creating a man-made mountain. For what purpose? We can still only speculate. There's ideas that this could have been a temple, that it could have had a mortuary function, but in the end, this is a massive monument here, and it was really about shaping and changing the landscape in order to produce it. You have a similar idea over here on the right. This is another mound structure in North America. This one's in in southern Ohio, and it's got this wonderful serpentine shape to it. This is actually the largest serpentine um, effigy in the world. And this one uh, dates back to about 2000 years old. So once again, um, the scale of this is really impressive. It's over 1300 feet long, and it, it would have been a massive coordinated effort of human beings who were dedicated to this project, creating something that essentially you could only see from the heavens. So once again, sort of these celestial, mysterious connections. So we'll go full circle in our seeds and roots here. We'll go back to Stonehenge and then to some oh, sort of more modern idea of, of landscape art, which is the, the mysterious crop circles that started cropping up around the 1970s and 80s. Um, these are, uh, even though they were, I, I think, proven to be hoaxes, they're great examples of earth art. It's using these natural materials here to create um to create these wonderful designs. But, but we have, you know, sort of the big ideas encapsulated in, in a wonderful image like this. So let's turn our attention to the 1960s, to the 1970s, and consider the climate and the conditions that really set the stage for the earth art movement. So some of this will be about the art world and some of this will be about what's happening kind of in popular culture, in current events. Let's start with art because at the beginning of the 60s you have um, the, the pop art movement in full force. You have artists like Andy Warhol who are obsessed with the superficial, with the commercial. Many of his works of art actually look exactly like, like commercials. They're, they're indistinguishable from advertisements. This, these are his Coke bottles over here. And then on the right, we have a soft sculpture from the artist um, Klaus Oldenburg. This is from 1963. And doesn't it just remind you of, you know, stopping by McDonald's or something looking, it's just a fantastic French fries and, and ketchup here. But again, it's this reminder of like the consumerist culture. It's the open embrace of the capitalist system. And it's also this idea of consume, 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 and, um, and waste, you know, the corresponding waste that goes along with it. And in the 1960s, there is a rising tide, a rising awareness of the pollution that is, um, that's, that's created by, um, by, by such, well, by, by such consuming. So now, uh, it, certainly the earth art movement is, um, is sort of created 
in response to this, in uh, as a rejection against this. Uh, earth art is in, in more ways than one sort of inspired by the minimalist movement in art. And here's a great example of a minimalist work of art. The artist here is Carl Andre. This is one of his sculptures called Equivalence 8. And this is from 1966. What we are looking at here is simply a pile of bricks. <laughs> but a minimalist artist would tell you that um, that minimalism is about considering the um, the the material here. You know what what is the the weight and the con and the consistency, the texture of these bricks. How are they arranged together? How does it? Um, how does it change the space that you're in? How does it? How do you interact with it physically? So you're thinking about really um, the the materials in a new way and your engagement with it in a in a completely different way. Now, just as a quick side note, this work here was acquired by the Tate London um, not too long after it was created for about the equivalent of six thousand dollars. Now we're looking at 120 bricks here that were paid um, with taxpayer dollars. And so you can imagine people thought it's pretty outrageous to that taxpayer money uh, went to <laughs> pay such an outrageous price for a pile of bricks. This has been called the most boring controversy in all of art history. So, um, so we have this notion of minimalism and, and it changing the way artists are thinking about the very nature of presenting artwork. But let's go back to the environment. There is a shifting tide in the way the people are looking at the planet and looking at pollution. There's a book from 1962 called Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. And it, um, it creates this, this whole new awareness. It really sounds the alarm about, um, about pollution and in particular, the, the dangers of synthetic pesticides. This book had such a huge influence after it was written for years after it was written that, um, that the, it sort of led to the creation of the US Environmental Protection Agency. So um, huge ripples there. Now, the image over here on the right, which is just such a, a fantastic image. It's like the kind of picture I'd love to look at every day because it's, it's a great reminder that your problems seem really small. We're looking at the earth, of course, um, seemingly from the surface of the moon here. This was a photograph taken by the astronaut Bill Anders in 1968, and it's called Earthrise. So um, when people saw this picture, it began to change the way they thought about the planet. It really does just look like a little marble floating out there in, in the blackness. And it's this reminder of how small we are and how precious our resources are, that there's only one planet. So a picture like this began to inform um, changing behaviors. By 1970, we have Earth Day. We have Richard Nixon and Pat Nixon planting a tree on the White House grounds. We've got demonstrations all across the country. This is one in Union Square in New York City. Uh, but people really rallying to, um, to see changes in, um, in policies that, uh, that impact the pollution of, of the air and the water um, and, and, and change, change policies in terms of how our resources are used, this new understanding of, of limited energy resources. All right, so we'll sort of round out this section with one of the most famous ads associated with this movement. And this was from Keep America Beautiful. It was the 1970 ad about pollution where there was a Native American figure who sort of moved through the landscape, noting just how sort of trashed and um, polluted it was. And then he turns to the camera with the single consequential tear running down his face, um, uh, you know, reminding us all how connected we should be to nature. And of course, incidentally, the man who played the Native American was not in fact himself a Native American. So it's another way of kind of so sounding the alarm of and of uh, reinforcing this notion that all Americans should be more connected to, um, to the environment and, and to the landscape that surrounds them. So all of this is a wonderful precursor for what we begin to see in the art world towards the late 1960s. And here's a great example example of what you begin to see. In galleries, artists are exhibiting piles of dirt. 
<laughs> can you imagine people um i can imagine that this was a very tough pill for a lot of people to swallow there's a kind of like conceptual minimalist way of displaying it on these little mirrors here which seems to kind of double the amount of dirt that we're looking at but this is the stuff that we wipe off our shoes when we go into our houses it's also the stuff that we grow our food in and and reconsidering uh, you know dirt and soil in a new way was um was certainly a novel artistic practice now this work here was created by robert smithson so we are going to turn our attention to him he's really our first and probably our most important earth artist here here are two great photographs of him probably in his early 30s now he coined the term earth art. He was also the founder of the movement itself. He grew up in New Jersey and he went to art school. And shortly thereafter, he's living in New York City. He's kind of, kind of trying to eke out um, a career as an artist and he does get gallery representation. And it's that gallery owner that begins to introduce him to all of these minimalist artists, including Carl Andre. So he's running in these avant-garde circles. And one of the artists that he's introduced to is Nancy Holt, who we'll also be meeting tonight, who, um, ends up marrying Robert Smithson. They become hus husband and wife uh, very quickly. Uh, and we'll talk about that connection a little bit later. But all of these relationships have a huge impact on the way these artists are thinking about engaging with you know, the landscape in a novel way and creating works of art that really challenge the viewer, challenge the audience. So I love these images of Robert Smithson. These are from the late 1960s. This is him with, um, with a work similar Similar to those piles of dirt that we saw before. These are just cases of rocks. And he referred to works like this as being non-sites. He would um, exhibit on the walls around them aerial views of the landscape where he got the rocks and maps of, of those areas as well. So he was connecting it to the site, but the rocks themselves were a non-site. I absolutely love this photograph of him loading the rocks into the back of his station wagon. I can imagine that the person taking the picture was thinking either this guy is a genius or he is totally crazy. <laughs> so, um, so Robert Smithson is actually the real philosopher of this movement. Everything is sort of comes from his thinking around this. Now, just to give you a sense in terms of how he thought, because he was writing these treatises all the time, but he wrote um, a, a, an essay about these kinds of works, the non-sites in 1968. It was called A Provisional Theory of Non-sites. Here's just a little snippet of it. This just gives you a sense in terms of how his brain works. He says, this little theory is tentative and could be abandoned at any time. Theories, like things, are also abandoned. That theories are eternal is doubtful. Vanished theories compose the strata of many forgotten books. So you can almost like you can almost visualize the way he thinks about theories as being these material things that that seem to like pollute um, not just libraries but um, but you know intellectual thought. So it's uh, it's just it's interesting interesting to be able to, to, to see how his mind works. Now, he's also interested in something else called entropy. Um, and that is the second law of thero thermodynamics, this idea of the inevitable depletion and collapse of systems. Now, for Robert Smithson, the reason he's interested in this is because he looks at you know, the history of the 20th century. He looks at America since World War II, and he thinks, you know, we all talk about progress as like the steady march forward to a better life. But what he saw instead was this sort of breakdown of systems and he related it to entropy. So he saw what started with order moving to disorder and then moving to chaos and collapse. And he, he saw this happening in, in civilization, but you know, the first place you see it really is in nature. So he developed this installation that's simply called dead tree. And that is exactly what we're looking at. The photograph is more recent because this is a more recent staging of the dead tree, according to his specifications. And so of course, what we're looking at is just a tree that has been unearthed and it's dying. If you have really good eyes, you might be able to notice that he has installed these mirrors around
around it as well. So as you walk around this dead tree, you might also see little bits of yourself with it too. But the purpose here is to see like shriveled up leaves and, you know, the roots that are, um, that are kind of uh, also shriveling up at the same time to see entropy at work with, um, with a, a, a dying organism like this one. So after all of this, Robert Smithson decides to spend a little time outside. So we see him here in, um, in the UK. He's standing next to a Neolithic tomb over here. And then he is at, I believe this is at Arches uh, National Park over in Utah. And he is, um, you know, standing next to Balanced Rock, which is this uh, famous monument where sort of like, uh, you know, the old man on the mountain in, in New Hampshire, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, everybody's just kind of waiting for this really impressive balancing game to collapse. So he begins thinking on a grander scale. He's really attracted to these kinds of works, natural, man-made, otherwise. Um, and, and so that leads us to the spiral jetty. And we're going to spend a little extra time on this work because it is the iconic work of the land of the earth art movement or the land art movement. So uh, the spiral jetty came into being in 1970. It was funded in part by a grant, a $9,000 grant by his gallerist. And we can see um, here, this is kind of an unnatural extension of the, of the, the landscape. This is the Great Salt Lake in Utah. And so we see this, um, this straight line, the spit that comes out, and then it coils onto itself in this counterclockwise mo uh, motion over here. So there's something about it that seems natural. We see spirals um, throughout the natural world, but it does not seem like something that could happen naturally. So, uh, and of course it's made out of natural materials. We'll look, at, uh, well, let's turn our attention to how it was made. Uh, Robert Smithson had a 30 minute video created on just how the, the spiral jetty came into being. And so you can see that he was using heavy machinery. At first, he couldn't get a contractor to call him back. Nobody was really interested in this art project. The man who he finally worked with commented years later, you know, the most important thing I've ever done actually served no purpose whatsoever. So, um, so in the end, what they made was a one, it's about 1500 feet long when all is said and done, and it's about 15 feet wide throughout. So this was a major movement of rock and earth and salt in this case. And, um, and it's worth mentioning that the reason in these photographs that the water looks so pink is because the Great Salt Lake is, um, it's a terminal basin. The reason it's called the Salt Lake is because the water can't flow out of it. It just flows into it. So, um, so when, as the water keeps evaporating, all that's left are these minerals and this salt um, meaning that almost nothing can live inside the Great Salt Lake. It's sort of like the Dead Sea that way. So there's just these tiny microorganisms that sometimes turn the water pink. Uh, the color was very attractive to Robert Smithson. He talked about um, being uh, uh, drawn to the, the sort of scarlet bleeding streaks in the water. And he even um, compared the Great Salt Lake to the primordial seas. He was, um, he was such a heady guy. So I mentioned before, uh, well, we talked before about uh, some of those prehistoric precursors to earth art and to land art. And it, so we can see that spirals uh, were featured prominently in, in earth artworks, uh, uh, you know, on the, in the northern and in the southern hemisphere with um, the Nazca lines and the mounds here, um, in this case from Ohio. They're also, like I said, a, a natural, it's a, a naturally occur, occurring form. We have it in our own fingerprints. We see it in nautilus shells and in plants and even the shape of our galaxy. And then there's this 
fantastic connection to numbers as well. There's the Fibonacci sequence where you take two numbers, you add them up and, the, and, um, and, and they begin to grow in a progressive way related to uh, the, the, the number that, that precedes it. So if you map this out in a grid, you can see that you are creating a spiral with that Fibonacci sequence. Um, so we've got these, you know, these great associations with the natural world, with math, um, and there's even other associations with art related related to the Fibonacci sequence is the golden ratio. And that is based on this idea of a rectangle of a rectangle with certain proportions so that when you divide it into a perfect square and another rectangle, that smaller rectangle has the same aspect ratio of the original rectangle itself. So artists have been relying on this golden ratio for centuries to create what they believe were um, these almost divine proportions in their works. So you can see a work like Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa is almost nothing but <laughs> the golden ratio. I mean, the entire painting itself can be divided up by those ratios and different components, different components of it throughout as well. You can even do one of these golden ratios on her face and continue to subdivide it, um, each of those rectangles into further golden ratios. And that brings you to to another spiral, of course. So, um, so there's all these incredible associations, so much heady stuff uh, related to the spiral jetty. But here's a really basic question for you. Uh, what do you do with it? <laughs> Are you supposed to go and visit or do the photographs themselves suffice for it? Because um, for Robert Smithson, he was really interested not just in building it, but then what was going to happen to it as years go by? How would nature treat this particular work of art? Now, if you're like me and you like to do art history based tourism, going to visit the site would be a pilgrimage. It's about two hours away from the closest airport. And then what do you do when you get there? Do you actually walk out onto this jetty and then just walk around in circles, get to the end and turn around and walk back? <laughs> when I think about actually going there and experiencing it, it reminds me of the form of a Gothic labyrinth. Now, labyrinths have been around for uh, well, since classical antiquity, but during um, the medieval period, as they were building Gothic churches, they would put these labyrinths, these meanders uh, um, in, in, um, in the floors of these cathedrals so that pilgrims, people who traveled a long distance to see the cathedral itself, could sort of uh, move through these, they're not mazes, it's not, it's not like a choose your own adventure, there's just a, a convoluted path, essentially, and they could follow that path and that was um, thought to be an experience for your mind, body, and soul. And actually, uh, Harvard medical researchers have um, have looked at the impact of walking a labyrinth like this, and it like lowers your your blood pressure, lowers your heart rate, and it can even help people with chronic pain. So you almost wonder, you know, did did Robert Smithson sort of know that on some level that if you were to walk out on this jetty and just follow this 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 path in the same way or in a similar way that it could actually transform people who were visiting now all this to say let's kind of wrap up on the spiral jetty here um Robert Smithson said nature is never finished and so his idea for this is that he'd build it and then over the decades to follow um, people would be visiting and documenting how it had changed and how it was kind of slowly coming apart. Now interestingly right after the spiral jetty was constructed it was submerged in the waters of the Great Salt Lake and was almost invisible for like two decades people practically forgot about it. But these days, the, the water is evaporating so rapidly that the shoreline is changing in the Great Salt Lake, and the spiral jetty doesn't even touch the water at this point. So it will continue to change, but maybe not in the way that Robert Smithson ever anticipated. So he did create other earthworks. That was his name for anything that he did in the natural landscape as opposed to the non-sites. And his last work was um, from 1973. It's called Amarillo Ramp. 
camp. And this was going to be in the basin of a man-made lake. And you can see it's just a very wide ramp that would slowly um, progresses upwards. And I, I don't know if it was going to like break the surface of the water, but it was, um, it was not completed during his lifetime because Robert Smithson tragically died at the age of 35, just 35. He was in an airplane surveying this location and the airplane crashed. So his wife, Nancy Holt, and a few other artists finished this work, but of course there's no man-made lake there. So it's another sort of monument to entropy and we'll slowly see it change as the landscape changes too. So let's turn our attention to Nancy Holt at this point, um, the woman who married the crazy man who is putting the rocks in, in you know, piles of, of dirt in New York City galleries. This is Nancy Holt. I like to think of her as kind of a local girl because she grew up in Worcester, Massachusetts, but she attended high school in New Jersey. And she that's actually where she met Robert Smithson. They went to the same high school. Um, they weren't uh, so close then. She went off to Tufts afterwards and got a degree in biology. And then they reconnected afterwards in New York City. And, um, and they were running in these same circles of these avant-garde um, minimalist artists. Initially, Nancy Holt was somebody who was interested in making art, but primarily video art and recording um, audio as well. She was actually the person who created the 30-minute film on the the creation of the spiral jetty. But from there, she begins to create some earthworks herself. And I think a lot of them are, um, are related to this notion of her being a, video, a videographer. And I think you can see that in this first work called Sun Tunnels. She started this in 1973, the year her husband died, and finished it in 1976, just a few years later. She purchased this land in the Great Basin Desert in Utah. Um, just for citing this project here. And what we're going to see she is doing is that she is specifically trying to frame our view, but not like a picture frame in a museum. It's more like a telescopic frame from a, a camera. And so it's sort of open, it's circular like this. And it, this is another work that I think has really interesting relationship with the heavens with celestial events, uh, sort of like Stonehenge. So let's get a, a better look at this work in particular. It was a massive undertaking. It might just seem like a couple of cylinders, but they were huge. Each one of them is 22 tons. This is Nancy Holt uh, directing the installation of them. And each of these tunnels is about nine and a half feet in diameter. And this is her standing inside one of them. So what's the purpose here? What's the idea? They're in a loose configuration of an X and they are arranged in such a way that sort of similar to Stonehenge, you would see the, stol the solstice and the equinox, the sunrise, the sunset um, through these specific framed views that she has created here. And uh, at this site, they, they last for a long time because it's, it's this open view. It's not like hitting this one point on the tunnel. So, um, so this is something you could experience 10 days leading up to the equinox or the solstice and 10 days afterwards as well. When you're there, oh, I should say too, a, another relationship that she created that corresponds to the sky is she had these holes bored into the side of the tunnels and the scale of them and their arrangement speaks to different constellations, four different specific constellations. Now, when you're there and you're visiting, apparently, it's about 20 degrees cooler inside the tunnels than from right outside in the desert. Um, and so when I read that, I just remember thinking, God, it would be just amazing to kind of dwell in one of these tunnels for a day and just see, you know, and appreciate the, um, the changing effects of the light and shadow in these spaces. There's something really kind of simple and beautiful about that idea. And I think when you look at the sun tunnels as a whole, um, you can see that she's added this very simple, beautiful poetry to the desert landscape here. But there's an important idea. These were meant to be used and they weren't meant 
necessarily to degrade over time. So this is a very different way, a different approach that Nancy Holt has to creating works of art. She is not thinking about entropy in any way. She's thinking about people and how they would engage with what she's making. What we're looking at here is a another project from the 1970s. This is called Stone Enclosure Rock Rings. And this is on the campus of Western Washington University. So this is absolutely something that people are, are supposed to visit and engage with. And she worked with um, stonemasons and astronomers to put this project together. And this project has an alignment with the North Star. Once again, she is using, I think, this background in videography or, or video um, art to frame up uh, views for us. And I think that this image over here on the left is so fantastic because even though it's just two concentric circles, you have this, um, this hallway of portals here that I think makes it seem so much uh, more substantial than it actually is. It, it's, um, it, it seems like a really interesting work of art. And it is, like I said, something that you're supposed to go and experience. Nancy Holt was a forerunner in um, um, in public sculpture, in public art, and integrating it into public parks and public spaces. And perhaps the best example of that is her work called Dark Star Park from 1984. This is in Alexandria, Virginia. Over here on our left is the before <laughs> image of what this space in Alexandria looked like. It was abandoned, it was trashed, it was ugly. And then she came along, she created these um, concrete spheres and, um, and a landscape that they could be integrated into. And of course, now we see the positive usage of this space, this beautiful space in, in the center of Alexandria. So from another perspective, we can see um, those spheres again, some of them have holes bored into them to sort of train our, our, our gaze again. We see that there are these little round reflecting pools that relate to the spheres, as well as a round tunnel or portal over here. So it's all fully integrated. It's like an immersive experience in this park. When we look at it from overhead, there are those um, little reflecting pools here. We can see that it extends across the street. There's two more spheres here, along with a couple of posts and some black stuff on the ground. Here is Nancy Holt just after the completion of this work. And she's standing next to those posts with the stuff on the ground. Now, what is that stuff? It's almost like the predetermined shadow because every year on, um, on I believe it's on uh, August 1st at 9.23 in the morning, the shadows from the spheres and those beams line up with, uh, with the black stuff on the ground. And it marks the anniversary of the day that this land was purchased by a man named William Henry Ross in 1860. Now, the purchase of this land is not something that I think people in town normally celebrated, but you can see everybody turns out to sort of see what seems like a celestial momentous event that is going to happen. Think of the civic pride that comes from something like that. This is, it's, it's a, a space that is meant to be used and it, um, and it creates such, a, such a, a, a strong sort of community connection here because of her design. So we'll finish up with Nancy Holt oh, very quickly here with this great image of her and Robert Smithson, probably from the 1960s. Now, he, he died when they were 35 years old. She lived for another 40 years. She never got remarried. She spent her life making these incredible projects like this um, all over the globe. And, um, and she re received numerous awards for it, but in my opinion, not nearly enough. And she also worked to preserve the, the memory of what her husband had accomplished too. So Nancy Holt died in 2014 at the age of 75 and her her will created the Holt Smithson Foundation. I highly recommend going to their website. Beautiful images, um, such great information about the two artists, their approach to their work. Interestingly enough, the will also dissolves the foundation in 2038. That would be um, on the occasion of their 100th uh, birthdays. And it's sort of like... Um, 
sort of like letting nature take over again, right? There's a little bit of entropy in that. All right, so let's turn our attention to um, Anna Mendieta, and I'm seeing we're a little bit, um, I'm a little bit uh, uh, low on time, so I'm going to talk even faster now. Anna Mendieta was a full decade younger than Smithson and Holtz, and so she was living in, well, she was in college as, as Robert Smithson was creating the spiral jetty. So she's a little bit behind the curve, but she will ultimately go to New York City and eventually run in these minimalist art circles as well. Like um, Robert Smithson, she actually died a very tragic and premature death. And we'll touch on that a little bit later. Anna Mendieta was born in Cuba and, um, and she lived about the first 12 years of her life there. These are her parents. Here she is at the uh, front and center. And um, because of a project called Operation Peter Pan, she and her sister were able to leave Cuba at this young formative age uh, and stay together, but they were separated from their families. This was sort of like, um, uh, they were like political refugees. They went to Iowa. They lived in foster homes and orphanages. They went to reform schools. You can imagine that this would have been really traumatic experience for a young person who came from an upper class background, very comfortable background. So she's kind of torn from Cuba and torn from her parents and living in this kind of awful setting. And so art becomes a refuge for her. And so even after she is unified with her family, she stays in Iowa and she goes to college there. She gets a BA, an MA, and an MFA while she is at the, um, at the University of Iowa. And so she's working as a sculptor, as a painter, as a video artist, and she will eventually move to, to New York City in 1977 when she's done with school. But I wanted to quickly show you a couple of her school projects, um, works that she created while she was still a student. This is an untitled work from 1972, where she's standing alongside a fellow student, and he is shaving and cutting his hair, and she is affixing it to her face. So she's kind of playing with gender fluidity here. She's doing things that I feel like um, most Americans are only just beginning to think about and talk about, um, but she's also experimenting with hair, which is dead skin cells, but it also grows and it can also be like severed from your body. So she, uh, this is kind of like her first, um, her first sort of dip of her toe into uh, working with organic materials. The same year, she also creates a video that is called Blood and Feathers. There's a lot of blood in her artwork. Um, she's always been interested in, um, in issues of violence against women. So she, she tries to make strong statements in her work, even from the same time, um, or even, even from this early period in, in, her, in, her, uh, in her work. So in this video, essentially she's standing out in nature next to the stream. She's stark naked. She pours chicken blood all over her um, front and back, and then rolls around in these feathers on the ground, and then sort of stands up in the posture of a bird here. So once again, working with with organic materials. There's, you know, seemingly like references to maybe Catholicism, maybe some Santeria here. Um, there's, there's a lot going on, but there's this, there's this idea of, of death, maybe sacrifice, transformation, or resurrection. So this all leads us to um, her Silhouetta series, which she does during, for about five years in the 1970s. This is an example of her Silhouetta work. And just to quickly compare it to Robert Smithson, um, obviously, Obviously, Anna Mendieta's work is on a much more human scale. There's no excavators involved with her, with her, um, uh, with her earthworks. And in fact, earthworks was with Smithson's word. Anna Mendieta called these body works, and it's really all about her, her body, her personal story. So what we see here is Anna Mendieta lying in a Mexican grave. And, um, and from the, what seems like a corpse, I mean, she seems anonymous here, we have all of these flowers growing out from, you know, between her arms, between her legs. So it's that same play that we saw with, um, with her and, and the facial here. It's this notion of something being dead, but simultaneously alive. And so over the course of the next 
five years, she's creating all of these works. Most of them are about her lying down in a geographic place that means a great deal to her, whether it's Iowa or Cuba or Mexico. She uses that silhouette as, um, as sort of the, the beginning of a work. So it might be, um, it might be filled with blood or something that looks like blood. It might be set on fire. It might be frozen. Sometimes she leaves her body there for the picture as well. But these are ephemeral. Um, they weren't meant to last. They weren't meant to, you know, bring groups out to, to view them. She's, she's creating something that will be preserved through photography. Here's just a few more of these works. Um, and here's what Anna Mendieta said about them. She said, I've been carrying out a dialogue between the landscape and the female body based on my own silhouette. I believe this has been a direct result of my having been torn from my homeland, Cuba, during my adolescence. I am overwhelmed by the feeling of having been cast from the womb or nature. My art is the way I reestablish the bonds that unite me to the universe. It is a return to the maternal source. This is her literally reestablishing roots with, um, you know, with, with mother nature, really. And so, um, so we've got all of these, these fantastic, sometimes they're sort of eerie and mysterious pictures here. Um, so, so these are, these are great works that kind of speak to this feeling of, of belongingness, uh, of feeling a, a sense of belonging or rootedness. Over here on the right, we see her lying face down, again, in the silhouette form in, um, in a pool of chicken blood. She goes back to chicken blood again and again, and it seems like that is foreshadowing something that we'll see um, in just a moment because once Anna Mendieta moves to New York City she becomes connected romantically connected to the preeminent mi minimalist artist Carl Andre the same artist who made the pile of bricks and the boring controversy at the beginning of the program they date for several years it's a sort of a tumultuous relationship there's a lot of drinking and a lot of fighting, but they get married in 1985. He's 13 years older than her. He's already incredibly successful as an artist. He's had a solo show at the Guggenheim. He's doing really well. Eight months after they get married, Anna Mendieta falls to her death from their apartment in, um, in Greenwich Village. They lived on the 34th floor of their apartment building. And so you can see from the headline here, sculptor accused of pushing his wife out, out of the window to her death. Uh, his uh, 911 call, he says, my wife is an artist and I'm an artist. And we had a quarrel about the fact that I was uh, more exposed to, to the public than she was. She went to the bedroom and I went after her and she went out the window. Now, um, apparently people heard them fighting. Apparently he had scratches on his nose. There were a lot of people that didn't believe his, um, his story here. And so he was tried for her murder, but acquitted based on lack of evidence, but the art world. And, um, and I think the feminist world surrounding the art world too, uh, still blames him for her death. And so he's still alive. His body of work is still highly regarded in the art world. And so when it is exhibited, oftentimes people show up and, um, and uh, essentially give voice to Anna Mendieta because she can no longer do that for herself. Um, some activists even throw chicken blood on the sidewalk in front of galleries that show his work. I think Anna Mendieta might be proud about that one. And the Guerrilla Girls, the anonymous collective of artists and art historians that call themselves the conscience of the art world, have even created this poster associating Carl Andre with, um, with O.J. Simpson. So, um, so so I think the art world is more fascinated than ever with the works of Anna Mendieta. And, um, and somehow I can't believe that Carl Andre still has a career. So we'll finish up the, the program with the much lighter and um, sort of fanciful works of Andy Goldsworthy. So he is a Brit. That's the OBE here. This is the Order of the British Empire. He was made an officer in the year 2000 for his contributions to the arts. We see him here in two photographs. Um, he grew up on a farm and he talked about um, 
the kind of rhythmic repetitious, the uh, repetitious work that he had uh, on the farm, you know, digging up potatoes or other works that uh, sort of established this rhythm in him that he uses to create these projects um, today as an artist. I should mention that he is, he, well, he was roughly, he was born right around the same time as Anna Mendieta. So he's younger than Smithson and Holt, and he's still alive today. He's 65 years old. So um, he went to art school and while he was there, he felt a little claustrophobic in his small studio, went outside and within the space of a few hours felt like he had learned so many lessons just from the natural world. He talked to his professor about it. His professor was like, look up the work of Robert Smithson. And basically Andy Goldsworthy never went back inside again. So Smithson, you can sort of think of as the philosopher. Goldsworthy is kind of the craftsman. So I'm going to force a little comparison here between the spiral jetty and an example of a spiral work by Goldsworthy. Um, Goldsworthy, I will say, doesn't create a lot of works that are spirals. He likes the, the context um, to inform what he creates. And so in this case, these are, you know, these smooth beach stones. You can see he has cracked every single one of them. I think just breaking a rock is hard enough to begin with, but he's broken them in such a way that he could align them in this beautiful spiral. And he's even even sort of scratched away the pigment on them as well. So he's creating something that is small scale, that's intimate, that is not meant to last at all. I mean, you could basically just kick this um, uh, little arrangement and it would be gone forever. Whereas Smithson was working on a much grander scale just to give us a sense. This is the context for the work that, that uh, Goldsworthy created. Now his student work sort of seems to, um, be a great precursor to what we're about to see. Um, in this student work here, he just took the, the chaos of all of these beach rocks and created what is almost a straight line leading out to the water. And it's it's ephemeral, it's not supposed to last. These, so, these stones almost immediately started sinking into the sand, people kicked them, they were washed away, but he was creating something with natural materials that essentially nature couldn't create on its own. So from there, he gets really interested in rock stacking and rock balancing. These are um, assemblages from the late 1970s on kind of a grand scale, a pretty impressive scale. Uh, in the next few years, and, and I should say, these works don't last. He takes photographs of all of them and the photograph is the evidence of the artwork. It's not like he's ever bringing crowds around to look at this. It's really just his intimate engagement with nature and then it's gone. Um, even though he himself claims he's very interested in this notion that, that the works collapse and then sort of go back to nature, for the most part, the, the, uh, the photo documentation is really about that magic moment where everything comes together, not when everything uh, goes, goes apart. So in the next few years, he continues to do rock stacking. And you can see these are really impressive um, uh, rock. It's impressive rock balancing. He's considered the father of modern rock stacking. Uh, I have a three-year-old son, which means that there are rocks everywhere in my house. So I was sitting at my dining room table the other day, just trying to put, you know, a stack together and I couldn't get past three rocks. So I encourage you to give it a try next time you're outside. In addition to rocks, he uses a lot of sticks in his compositions. This was a composition he made in um, Colorado in 2006. It's a wonderful work because, you know, it reminds you of, you know, the, the structure of the ripples um, in water. If you throw a stone into water, it also reminds me of the planet Saturn. But he had to go out and he had to find kind of the perfect sticks to use in a composition like this. And he said it took him way longer to find the sticks than to make the composition takes the picture and then it all sort of floats away. It doesn't last for long. Uh, here is another work made of sticks. These are sycamore sticks and it's on a larger scale. These are, it looks like a giant serpent, doesn't it? It almost reminds me of that serpent effigy that we saw before. And, um, and this was one where uh, I, I think one of the endearing things about Andy Goldsworthy is that he fully admits that this can be uh, a really frustrating process. And he was working on this in, in the rain. He said, the work is becoming irritating to me. That's what he wrote in his 
his journal, he said, still very windy and wet. <laughs> but he seems, you know, determined, well, he's inspired by the setting, by the available materials, and, um, and works from there. It's not like he designs something uh, in his head or on paper and then um, sets out to go and create it. He goes out to nature, and he works with what he sees. Um, other works, uh, more recent works with sticks. Um, here, he's created this little bridge that doesn't span the water, but it instead sort of emerges and then uh, uh, goes back into the water over here. And this absolutely remarkable arched doorway here. You can only imagine how many times these things collapsed in the process of building them. Sometimes Andy Gold, Goldsworthy uh, it injects himself, almost like performance art, into his artwork. This is called Hedge Crawl, and it's literally just him walking on these hedges here at dawn. Uh, he wrote, uh, dawn, frost, cold hands. This is from 2014, but he looks like he's some sort of stick man here, right? He looks like he is in and of nature. He also is known for doing um, these works called rain shadows. So when it starts to drizzle, which I can imagine is all the time in the UK, he lives in Scotland, I should mention, he lays down on the ground, lies down on the ground, and, um, and he just lets the water fall on him. He says he's gotten very intimate with the different types of raindrops there are, you know, the fat ones and the tiny ones. Uh, and then he'll stand up and reveal, you know, his silhouette here. I think it's worth um, just comparing this to an Anna Mendieta silhouette who uh, was creating, you know, a very similar idea, uh, but for very different reasons, very different purpose. Uh, Goldsworthy still creates these rain shadows today, uh, sometimes even in urban settings. This is in New York City. As he was creating it, like people are literally just stepping over him on the sidewalk, and then you've got your rain shadow. Um, but it's it's all sorts of things that he finds on the ground that inspires his artwork. Uh, leaves in particular are, um, are a great source of material for him and a great source of color for his works too. He he is sort of visionary in how he can organize the color of leaves and create these beautiful compositions. He's particularly drawn to these kind of circular nest-like compositions with a void at the center, uh, creating more serpentine lines. I love how this one goes from green with the yellow stripe to yellow with the green stripe. And then um, his use of these yellow leaves in particular is absolutely mind boggling to me. This is a sycamore tree with its leaves kind of grouped together right here at the root system. My seven-year-old son said, oh, it's like the floor is lava here. I mean, he has transformed the, the, the forest floor into something otherworldly, absolutely magnificent. Here he's just used um, the yellow leaves, I think from an elm tree, just to create this kind of lacy line across these rocks here in the water. And then sometimes he just uses his own spit <laughs> to, to transform these leaves and to make them sticky. Here, it almost looks like he's created a sweater out of leaves for this branch over here. So he's very inventive um, and he's, you know, obviously still working today. So he's had this long career and there's a great variety in his work. There's also this illusion sometimes of simplicity. He likes to work in snow and ice. And you look at something like this, which is really just stacked snowballs. And you think, well, I could probably do that, but we, you know, you probably haven't. <laughs> so, um, so in, in Scotland, it doesn't ever really get too cold for too long. So he has this kind of frantic pace when he, when snow is available, he can make a, a composition like this. When ice is available, um, he can, uh, uh, break up icicles and reform them into really interesting shapes. This one here with this, uh, once again, this kind of serpentine line that go, seems to go in and out of this rock here is really so incredible. You can find videos of him at work on YouTube and he's literally like just breaking icicles. Sometimes he's chewing them down and reforming them together and just kind of using a little bit of water to reseal them back. Um, this ice sculpture is particularly particularly mind boggling to me, the starburst that he created. And it was something that collapsed two days later and just shattered to a million pieces. So we're so lucky that he's able to snap these photographs of what he creates. But once again, they're not meant to last and they're not meant to draw crowds. It's his experience in nature. 
um, sometimes he goes far afield. He went all the way to the North Pole to create these, um, these round portals here. He used indigenous techniques uh, in terms of cutting the snow and, and building these archways. I have to just state for the record, it's really hard to build an arch and he's done it here three times or four times over. Um, incidentally, because he did this on the top of the world, um, if you move through any of these portals, you're heading south, which is kind of cool. And they sort of frame up the landscape sort of similar to the Nancy Holtz that we've seen so far tonight. So we'll end uh, with Andy Goldsworthy going back to stone for a moment. Um, this is a stone wall that he created at Storm King, which is an outdoor sculpture park in New York State. And his serpentine wall here is um, sort of loosely inspired by an old like field stone wall that was kind of uh, fall falling to ruin that was already on the property. So he came in with a team and they uh, constructed this wall. At the time, it was his first museum commission for a permanent work in the United States. The wall is mostly about five feet tall. It's 2000 feet long and it's more than 15 tons of rock. So, um, so this was a major undertaking. And, and you know, why? What, what, what's the point here? I wanted to just show you how it kind of moves through the landscape here and how it circles and includes and excludes different tree trunks here. I've, I've read a lot of interesting interpretations about this work. Um, some people think that it's sort of a statement on um, American culture and how we so love to take sides on different issues. I think that, you know, that seems to hit the nail on the head for me, but it also reminds others of um, Robert Frost and mending fences and this idea of, you know, good fences make good neighbors, even if those fences are absolutely unnecessary, just keeping, you know, not livestock away from each other, but different kinds of trees away from each other. So there's a, a lot of poetry, I think, embedded in a work like this. You'll notice in this image that the, that the wall is built in such a way that it looks like it's just going down into the water. And here you can see it goes down into the water and then it re-emerges on the other side of that body of water. And it's a straight plain old wall here <laughs> from there on. So I think he's got a sense of humor. So we'll wrap up tonight um, just with a, a quick recap of these four main artists that we saw and an appreciation for their contributions. We start with Smithson, who was our ph philosopher, our theoretician. Um, he came up with these key concepts. He made them valid and he created created it on a grand scale. Then we had Nancy Holt, who had a very different approach. She brought the heavens down to earth, and she built things that were made to last and made to bring people together. They, they've become sites and gathering spaces. And then we saw Anna Mendieta, whose work was so personal. It was um, her excavating kind of this emotional pain that she endured, her explorations of her body, her gender. They're very raw. They're very powerful. And, um, and they seem to kind of foretell this tragic death of hers. And then we finished up with Andy Goldsworthy. Aren't these just such great works? He was our craftsman. He was the person who was creating these incredible ephemeral constructions and engagements with the landscape, producing something that nature itself never could. Andy Goldsworthy once said, we often forget that we are nature, all capital letters. Nature is not something separate from us. So when we say we have lost our connection to nature, we have lost our connection to ourselves. So that's probably a good note to end on and a good reminder to go out and get your hands in the dirt sometime soon. So from uh, I'll end now and I'll welcome any questions or comments you might have about the earth art that we looked at tonight. Well, Jane, I just have to say that I have been, I, I'm never disappointed in your programs. They're always extremely fascinating. I'm always listening to you. And then I'm on looking things up on the computer as you mentioned them and trying to take notes. And I'm just so excited about everything you're sharing that um, I'm delighted that you're allowing us to record this because I know I'm going to have to go back and watch this again. So I just want to say thank you for a spectacular presentation and just something that I, I found really very interesting and inspiring. Um, our, our group 
um, has been has been very quiet in chat. So I don't have any questions in chat, but if anybody has anything that they'd like to ask, um, please don't hesitate to unmute and um, and speak up and share your questions or your comments. Has, I'm curious, has anyone ever seen these in person? Mm. I, hi, I, this is a remarkable presentation, so knowledgeable and I was mesmerized. Okay. I have seen the things at Storm King and yes, and, and I have seen that and I've seen photographs of other things, but I'm so appreciative of your uh, sharing your knowledge so, so beautifully. You're I, so I, kind. I'm, I I'm am always curious. still learning. <laughs> I'm I'm curious if you've ever seen the um, sculpture in the wild in Montana. No, which is I where haven't. I'm, from. I'm not familiar well, with that one. Oh, wild? you you must you must look it up online. It's called the Blackfoot Pathways, and it's an outdoor installation of of huge things <laughs> um, made of wood and and whatnot. Um, very reminiscent of uh, Goldsworthy. Please, it's called Blackfoot Pathways. You are going to want to visit. That's the problem with all these places, right? You have to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I, so it really uh, made me happy to remember my time there. And, uh, and, and I look forward to maybe hearing some more from you. So thank you very, very much again. Thank you for coming tonight and thanks for your kind words. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I, I, like I said, I'm always learning it. I, I gave this program last week and somebody asked me if, um, if Andy Goldsworthy had any work in a nearby sculpture park to where I lived. And I was like, oh, to be honest, I haven't been there yet. I don't know. And somebody emailed me after the fact and said, Andy Goldsworthy is going to be at this sculpture park in New Hampshire next month. So if anybody oh. became a big Andy Goldsworthy fan and feels like taking a little drive, <laughs> I think you can, you can meet him next month. I think it is May 12th. And the website for that is called Alnoba, A-L-N-O-B-A. I'll put it right here. 